Well, let's open our Bibles this evening to Joshua chapter 21, verse 43. Joshua chapter 21 effectively ends the report of the, re, the successful division of the land that took place seven and a half years after God brought the nation of Israel into the land of promise. And the book of Joshua doesn't go into great detail about the defeats over the enemies in the land. In fact, it deals with a couple of major battles, one at Jericho, one at Ai for sure. But beyond that, it is kind of a geographical description that the Lord gives us, that there is a, a battle that takes place for the center, or the middle of the country, if you will, a battle that, that takes place against a bunch of very strong kings that come from the south, and then a bunch of strong kings that come from the north. And rather than going into detail, the Lord just tells us in, in, in really just a chapter and a half, that seven and a half years pass, and the, and the Lord has given them great victory. Well, after the battles... Then, of course, comes the division of the land. And we read in those chapters of, of how the Lord gave to every uh, one of the tribes a portion of land. We gave you some maps if you were here for those. And uh, last week we looked at chapter 20 and 21. The final kind of division was to the Levites, the priests. And we talked to you about how the Lord gave them 48 cities. Six of them were, were kind of sanctuary cities, if you are, places of refuge from those who had committed a, a crime worthy of death or had done so accidentally, they could get a fair trial. But that, in many ways, the, the Levites' uh, place in the land was much like the church today. They were scattered about bringing God's word to the nation. The book of Joshua covers 25 years from beginning to end. It starts about you know, 1405 B.C., runs through about... Uh, 14, uh, 1380. The first seven and a half years, like I said, were devoted to Joshua leading the nation into battle. The last 17 and a half years were just the handing off of the, the land and all uh, to the various tribes who were called by the Lord to then clean up their own area. But by the time they were given it, the Canaanites had been reduced in power and strength dramatically. And with Joshua getting older and unable to go on, if you will, as the commander of the armies, uh, the Lord gave that responsibility to the individual tribes. It's much like, you know, you, you begin to grow up and someone disciples you and helps you and you can call them for anything, but at some point you got to kind of start walking. And they had to start walking now by faith so that they could get rid of these other tribes that the Lord wanted to destroy. He wasn't giving them any more time or any more grace. It was time for judgment. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, much of the uh, troubles that follow are because the children of Israel refused to do that. And they left these pockets of resistance, you know, these, these idolaters, and they began to affect God's people, and it had disastrous consequences, which we'll see in the book of Judges. Now, what we have left to look at in this book is the return of two and a half tribes to the other side of the Jordan. These were the two and a half tribes that had asked for that land before they came into the land of promise. Remember, they were cattle raisers, uh, the, the tribe of uh, Reuben and, and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. They were obligated by Moses that you can have the land, but first you come and fight with us. And once we take the land completely, then you can go home, which is found in chapter 22. And, and next week we will just spend our time in chapter 22 looking at the consequences of settling outside the land, settling for less than God's best, and, and the confusion or the misunderstanding that came as a result between the people in general and these two and a half tribes in particular. I think there's some interesting things to learn about misunderstanding and communication that we could benefit from greatly. Then we'll look at Joshua's farewell address, chapter 23, to only the leaders, the heads over the families and the tribes, and then chapter 24, to everyone, including the leaders, the two and a half million plus folks, before Joshua will die and, and uh, Aaron's son, Eleazar, will die and, and the new generation will be you know, presented to us. Tonight, though, I wanted to just stop with you in three verses. Chapter uh, 21, verses 43, 44, and 45, because it, it, it's, it's this wonderful declaration coming from a man who had been around for a long time. You know, he'd, he'd been with Moses, 
plus 40 plus years in the wilderness, had, had been in charge now for the better part of um, six and a half, uh, seven and a half years, w- would be with him for quite a bit more time. He's 93, I think. He dies at 110 or so. But, but it, it's such a remarkable declaration to make at the end of this big, long process that you know, for hundreds of years the children of Israel had, had lived with, and now they were there. They were in the land, they had their portion, they had their instruction, the priests were planted, the, the folks that were leaving were leaving, and there was this realization in, in Joshua's heart for the people and for himself, man, God did everything he said. You know, he is faithful, you can trust him, he will do exactly what he said. And so he, he says to the people, just in a, a couple of verses here, that just that, that, that not one word has failed of all that God has say, said. And if you believe that, you, you must live a, live a pretty good life. Because if you truly believe God will not fail, that what he has said he, he will do, um, there's a glorious future waiting for you, and it'll start right now. <laughs> Verse 43 says this, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land to which he had sworn to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they dwelt in it, and the Lord gave them rest all around, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not a man of all of their enemies could stand against them, for the Lord delivered all their enemies into their hands. Not a word, a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. That's a pretty cool declaration, don't you think? And for 93-year-old Joshua, who was about ready to retire, really couldn't go anymore. Um, this is his lesson that he walks away from, you know, a half, half a century worth of experience with the Lord. I, I want you to notice, and if you are, are one to take notes, you might want to circle in your Bible the word all in these three verses. There are six of them in all. Three little verses, six alls. It it had been nearly 700 years earlier that God had spoken to Abraham as he was standing up on the bluffs of Bethel. And he watched his little nephew Lot move towards the east, towards greener pastures, facing Sodom and Gomorrah, looking to the Jordan plains. This is what the kid wanted. He, He went by what he saw. But Abraham saw much more. When that sad parting of the ways occurred, the Lord in Genesis 13 said to Abram, Abraham, I want you to look north. And now look south and then east and turn around and look to the west. All of the land that you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. And I'm going to make a nation of you as the dust is of the earth. If man could number the dust of the earth, he might be able to number you. So rise up, walk through the land, walk its breadth, walk its length. This is yours. I'm going to give it to you. Here, 700 years later, Joshua stands with two and a half million folks and says, God did it. Unbelievably, God did it. 700 years earlier, it was a dream in the heart of Abraham and a word from the Lord that he loved. But God had fulfilled his promise first made to Abraham and then handed off to every person patriarch that followed, every family. Everything that you would have seen had Joshua climbed up the hills of Mount Bethel that day, everything he could see from where he stood was theirs. It all belonged to God's people. Wherever he looked, Mount Hermon to the north, that belongs to us. To the east, the mountains of Gilead and and Moab, those are ours as well. To the west, all of the the, the land that reaches out to the Mediterranean Sea. To the south, every hill of Jerusalem and and roundabout. It all belonged to God's people, even as the Lord had said. They waited long enough. They balked after 40 years of of, of being brought, or I should say, for 40 years they had to wander because of it. Uh, But it only took a little while by the time the Lord began to move and they began to follow him. The the Lord's promises had come to pass. That's how sure his word is. Now, it didn't mean that there weren't any enemies left to fight. There were lots of pockets of resistance. In fact, if you go back and read, I think, the first couple of seven or eight verses in chapter 13 of this book, God goes out of his way to say, and there's a big enclave over here, 
There's a bunch of guys over there, and there's a hot spot over here. We're going to have to, to deal with that. But even though there was resistance left, the people were in a position where had they just walked with the Lord and looked to him, every threat to their security and victory uh, would have been removed. They would still have to be faithful. They would still have to obey. But everything that God had said, God did. And that's something you and I can hang on to. You, you, whatever you read in your Bible, count on it. God doesn't fail. The promises of God are sure. His word is sure. A, a little bit more than 700, uh, 700, seven years earlier, not 700, they were still camped on the other side of the Jordan River. Moses had just died. And the Lord had come to Joshua and spoke in his ear. What he said to him is found in the first chapter of this book, beginning in verse 2. This is what the Lord said to Joshua. And I, I suspect that this became his life verses, at least over these many years of battles. This is what the Lord said to Joshua, who was, you know, 86 years old. My servant Moses is dead. I want you to arise and go up into Jordan, you and all of this people, to the land that I'm giving to you, the, to you, the children of Israel. Every place that the soles of your feet will tread, I will give it to you as I said it to Moses. From the wilderness and this Le Lebanon, as far as the great river of Euphrates, through all of the land of the Hittites of the great sea, uh, towards the going down of the sun, it'll be your ter territory, and no man shall be able to stand before you all of the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I won't leave you, I won't forsake you, so be strong, have good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance of this land which I have swore to their fathers to give them. Just be strong, be courageous, that you may observe to do all of that is written in the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Don't turn to the right or to the left so that you might prosper. And wherever you go, don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. Observe to do all that is written therein. For then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll find good success. Haven't I commanded you? So you be strong, be of good courage, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever he, you, you go. Seven and a half years later, Joshua is set to retire, and everything that God said was so. Everything he said was so. And now the job of corporate victory is handed to the individual. Now you've got to go home to your land and you've got to be that man or that woman of God that God can use to rid the land of those who were still you know, fighting against God. God had never failed them once. Joshua knew it. The people knew it, knew it. And I would say it is good for you and I to remember that tonight. God doesn't fail. Your government will fail you. Your insurance company will fail you. Your neighbor might fail you. Your brother in Christ will fail you. Hey now, <laughs> hope it ain't me, but he won't fail. God doesn't fail. And so here's a summary just quickly of the goodness of God. And it is Joshua's kind of his, his gathering together of all that he has realized. His statement of encouragement to remind these folks of God's faithfulness. He gives them four things to think about. You might want to write them down. He says here, God has been faithful to give you the land. God has been faithful to give you rest. God has been faithful to deliver your enemies, all of them, into your hands. And then just to kind of making sure he didn't leave anything out, he ends by saying, God has been faithful to everything he said. Every promise of God he has been faithful to. I, I think those are the kind of words that make you fall in love with the Lord that you serve. And you fall in love with the word all. <laughs> because he uses it enough. So verse 43, the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he swore, and they took possession of it, and they dwelt in it. Seven and a half years earlier, the second generation began their conquest of Canaan. They began with the Lord saying to them early on in this book, look, every place that you put your feet is yours. In, in every battle that they face, you, re, you will hear the Lord saying to Joshua or to the leaders, look, I have given them into your hand. There's no way you can lose. 
These guys can't overcome you. They can't overwhelm you. Oh, they may be bigger than you and stronger than you and better equipped than you, but you can't lose because I've given them into your hand. With that promise came instructions of victory, how to go about fighting the battles. And they weren't always the same, but they all depended on the, the individual listening to what God had to say and, be, and, and obeying what he had to say. You couldn't box God in and say, this is always the way he works. But the fact that he never lost, that you can certainly declare. The directions from the Lord varied. The victory did not. He, he gave them the land, but the receiving of it depended very much upon their obedience. Would they do what God said? Would they go about it the way that he set that before them? Great victories, small victories, miraculous, all of them. And it was certainly God's will that, that over these seven and a half years, two and a half million people would walk away from that experience saying, well, we better do it the way he says. But this is certainly God's work in our midst. Only the personal battles remained, which is what God wanted for them. You know, we, we've mentioned to you, I think, more than once that the history of Israel in the Old Testament is typical in, in, in the fact that it, it typifies or exemplifies the kind of spiritual life that you would walk. You know, the land of promise is not heaven. Way too many enemies there for it to be heaven. But it is a life that you live in the spirit where, you know, the, the wilderness is a place you wander around and go nowhere. The, you know, the promises of God are that he'll fill you with his spirit and he'll give you victory over the enemy, that you'll, you'll conquer it and be more than, than conquerors. And so you see that same picture here. You know, the Holy Spirit sends you and I into the world. There, there's an enemy there of our souls. He wants to, to take us out. But, but in reality, in my life, you should be losing ground and in yours, right? We should be experiencing more of God's victories in our life. God has lots for you. I think your Bible on your lap has God promising you far more than you have tonight. But it's there. He promises you an inheritance of peace and of rest and of joy, of needs met and promises fulfilled, of victory and power, more than you need. Never giving you more than what you could handle. Victory over the sin that easily besets you. What if, if I was to say to you, what ground have you gained in the land of promise this year as God's man or God's woman. Between January and now, what ground have you gained in your walk with God? How much of the world you know, has, has been put away? and how, how much have you advanced? What progress have you made? What, what goals have you set? How about the rest of this year? What battles are you fighting? What need to be fought? You know, where, what areas do you need to grow in? It isn't like God hasn't promised you and I victory, but it does depend on us as to what we really will commit ourselves to, you know, whether it's anger or, or self or materialism or lust. I mean, the enemy wants to stop your progress, but the Lord wants you to win. Put your foot down, man, it's yours. Take a stand, fight the battle. It, it belongs to you. The, the big work of your salvation has been accomplished in most of you, I, I would suspect, but, but that is your area of personal growth, Right? And personal victory has to become a reality. You know, it isn't going to be long. Half of the year is going to be gone already. Can you imagine? Did we not just have Christmas? I, I remember Christmas. And it's almost half over. You know? What kind of, what kind of gain are you making as a believer? Joshua said to this generation, man, we, we were given everything that God promised. And for that time and in these years, aside from a couple of real bad moves, you don't read of the children of Israel disobeying the Lord, looking the other way, grabbing for weapons that they couldn't use. Uh, aside from, from the AI debacle and the, and the agreement that Joshua and the leadership made with the Gibeonites early on made, it, made some really dumb moves, mostly because they didn't pray, just assumed. Other than that, you don't find any bumps in the road. Now, you'll find plenty in three chapters from now, when a whole new generation shows up and they don't know God and they've, they don't know his power and it wasn't passed along and there's great trouble waiting. But we have the opportunity to gain ground if you're willing. 
When Paul wrote to the Hebrews in chapter five of Hebrews, he, he said the time has come when you should be teachers by now, you have rather need to be taught the full first principles of the, of the words of the oracles of God. You're still wanting to drink milk. You're not ready for, for solid food. You're unskilled in the words of righteousness. You're just a baby. And then he said, strong food belongs to those who are of full age, who by reason of use have their exercising their senses to be able to discern good and evil. And then Paul says, so get off the basics and get on with life. Grow up. There's so much more that God has for you than laying again the foundation of, of the doctrine about the baptism or laying on of hands or the resurrection from the dead or eternal judgment. Just get on with it, man. That's stuff you should know by now. Now grow up and get to move. And God had given them faithfully all of the land. He promised them hope, promises you hope, and, and confidence and fruitfulness We will read here that the Lord gave Israel all the land, but then you set next to that the the words, well, there are pockets of resistance. That may be. But if there's no doubt that you can have them, God just declares it in in the past more often than not. If there's a doubt, the Lord goes, I hope I can do it. But he he declares it in the the past tense so that you might know there's no doubt here. God, God can give you victory over your flesh. God can make you a man or a woman of God. You can be fruitful in this generation. You can stand up and make a difference. You can. Because you belong to him. The land was given the potential for um, growth or or victory was there. The the only time they failed was when they stopped listening listening and and stopped following. Those were the two places of of tremendous failure. I don't hear what God has to say. I'm not going to do what he says. And then we wonder, you know, where is the Lord? Peace is available. Joy is available. Gaining ground is available. You don't want to sit here in church 10 years later and and be fighting the same sins that you fought 10 years ago. You should be by them by now. Oh, there'll be another set to deal with. But growth is, is how that happens, isn't it? So... All of that is promised, what we receive of it depends upon how we respond. God gave them all of the land. Verse 44 says, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Isn't that interesting? Not only do they have the potential to take every square foot, God says in the midst of the battle with, with, with the enemy living close by and the skirmishers that would inna- invariably happen, the Lord said, I've just given you peace in every direction. And you want to go, time out, Lord. That's not peace. But the Lord doesn't lie. (laughs) The children of Israel had the upper hand. There were challenges. Some of them were substantial. Um, But here's the deal. They were not going to be able to look to Joshua anymore to lead them. Right? It was time for them to stand on their own two feet. They're going to have to hear from the Lord now and walk in the things that they learned from him. He wasn't going to be there to hold their hand. He wasn't going to be there to tell them, well, here's what I think the Lord would want us to do. It was time for them to grow up and to rest in him and to do so on their own. God said, I've given you rest. I would say that if they didn't know the Lord, there was no rest living with them. The people around, the the enemy, their their wickedness, there wouldn't be any time for rest there. And and yet, the, the foes were no longer insurmountable because these Two and a half million folks should have grown in their understanding of who the Lord was. Look, you're in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, many of you. You should know the Lord better than you've ever known him. Right? Your faith should be stronger today than it has ever been. Certainly stronger than the day you got saved. Oh, I remember the day I got saved. Great. Where have you gone since then? From here to right there? No, that's not good. I took two steps forward and three steps back. Here I am. It's not good. God wanted them to know him in such a way that that his relationship with you as his people would make you far greater in strength than the enemies who would like to destroy you. And that'll, if you know the Lord's rest, if you have that rest, it'll affect every place of your life. In your home, at your your job, with your relationships and your ambitions. If God be for you, who can be against you? It's true, isn't it? If God is for you, 
Who can be against you? No one can. It, it was that conviction that caused little young David to charge a big Goliath behemoth guy. All he knew was, you're offending my Lord. I don't think he likes it. I'll be happy to be the vessel through whom he destroys you. If God is for me, I'll just go and take a few rocks and see how we do. So there were plenty of tests that came to these folks in the next many years since Joshua would speak this, over the next, let's say, two decades or so. But if they acted only on what they had learned, they would have been fine. They'd be able to stand on their own and, and survive. Can you rest tonight in the battle that you face in the Lord? Are you convinced? Joshua was pretty proud of the God that he served. He's given us all the land. He's given us rest all around. There's no one that can take us out. There's no one that can take us on. There's no one that can be a threat to us. Said 93-year-old Joshua, hacking and coughing and wheezing and leaning on his cane. There's no one that can take me. And he, and he was right. He was absolutely right. I have given, see? And the Lord have given. That's past tense. He'd, he'd given them the promise, the, sure, the sureness, the rest. His word was sure. When Isaiah would write in, in Isaiah, what is it, chapter 26, right? You will keep his mind in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Where do you get peace? By knowing the Lord. Right? Where do you find rest? You find rest in re resting in him. And he gives us, what does Paul say, the Ephesians chapter, no, Philippians chapter 4, right? Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, isn't it? His peace will, the peace of God will, will surpass all of your understanding. It will guard your heart and your mind. His peace will, will fill your heart. The Lord says, I have given you rest round about. The kind of rest that I promised to your fathers, no man will be able to stand against you. No enemy will have victory against you. I will deliver you out of their hand, every single one of them. Rest. Rest. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no way to, to describe to people what kind of rest this is. Right? People go, how can you have peace at a time like this? And you say, well, the Lord's in charge which makes no sense to them unless they know him. And if you know him, it makes perfect sense. Oh yeah, that's true. As long as he doesn't fall off the throne, it will be good. As long as he doesn't capitulate, we're gonna be fine. You know, this isn't a peace that you can, can get readily by, by reasoning. I remember talking with a guy who had a terrible time flying. He was sure the plane was gonna crash every time he got on. And, and you could rationalize with them and tell them there's a million people in the air, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all over the world. There's a million people with their feet off the ground right now. You'll be all right. But what if I'm not? Well, then you're dead. But until then, <laughs> you're good. That's rational thinking, and it didn't help him. You can't get the peace of God through rational thinking. You can't will it into existence. From now on, no more worry. Good luck with that. That won't help you. You can't gain this peace by thinking it through or, or because the things that you might face are overwhelming. You can only find the rest that comes by knowing God. You're distinct from the world. You serve a God who lives. And he's for you and not against you. And if he's for you, no one can be against you. That's exactly what verse 44 says. You can't lose. I, I, forever I'm hearing Christians lament their situations as if somehow God has just been whooped. Oh, my boss at work. Well, really, who is he there anyway? Well, you know, he's not letting me, well, you just tell the Lord, who's bigger than your boss at work. Oh, this guy down the street from me. Yeah, you just tell the Lord. He's bigger than that. He's always bigger, isn't he? He's always stronger. If you believe that, you can rest. You can always rest. You can be sure to rest. Seven years of watching God work should have brought a rest to the people only because they knew what he could do. The enemy was a, uh, a shadow of, him, of his former self by now, and, and God had grown large in their understanding. 
by comparison. They should have had a rest that maybe you know, couldn't have been discovered early on, but they'd had a long time to sit and watch. I think it was Isaiah who said in chapter 14 as he was speaking about the devil, he said, they're going to gaze at you one day and they're going to say, is this the man that made the whole world to tremble and shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who wouldn't open the doors for the prison? Is this the guy that's caused all of that trouble? And we're going to be, I think, amazed as God's people what a puny guy Satan's going to look like by comparison. Oh, not you and him. You're, you're done. But you and the Lord. This wasn't even a contest. Right? This is not even a problem. There were those in the land that were still tra- problematic, but they should have rest. Look, you're saved tonight. You're, you're resting in God's care. There, the, the Bible would or you, order you not to be anxious. Now, I know that's a hard command to receive. Quit worrying. I used to say to my wife, quit worrying. And she, oh yeah, thank you for the counsel. That's great help. <laughs> but that's all I know. Stop it. Just knock it off. Believe the right things. Know the right things. Find that rest that God alone can provide. I've sworn it to your fathers. I love that when the Lord begins to talk about his promises, he often uses the word, I have sworn, which means to take an oath or to take a pledge. It's almost like the Lord kind of bends over and talks to us in language that we would understand. Right? How can I trust you? Oh, I swear to, I swear to me. I'll do what I say. You can count on it. That promise of rest for our souls. Read read Hebrews chapter 4. I think the first 11 verses which talk about a rest being available to the people of God. If we just won't miss it by unbelief, then we can rest. And Joshua looked at two and a half million folks that he wasn't going to be leading anymore. And seven, seven and a half years earlier, they had never even set foot in the land. And now it was all theirs. And he went, high five, the Lord is awesome. This land's all ours, and we are at rest. Anything that now threatens our rest is really a matter of just letting God be God. He says in in verse 44, the third thing he said was that he delivered them from all of their enemies. That not one of their enemies could stand against them because the Lord would deliver all of their enemies into their hands. I love that. If we're at war in this world because of who we serve, I know one thing for sure, we're gonna win the battle. I don't care who they are, who they think they are, God fights our battles. Cities, kings, confederacies, armies, 31 of them that are named in this book sought to obliterate obliterate the, the children of God from the face of the earth. They were out to get them. They were, they were organized together. They, they came not hiding their intentions, but, but wearing them on their sleeve. We're going to wipe these guys out. We're going to bring everyone with us. There's no way you're going to be able to stand. Everything w- was, was, was set against the people of God. And, and by the time the years went by, Joshua looked around and goes, <laughs> where are those guys? We win. Our enemies are defeated. God has fought us. 31 kings befell before a young nation who didn't really fight very well. Most of the cities had big walls of protection. They had citadels and fortresses. They, they marched under banners that would have frightened anyone in the land except for the Jews, except for the people that God had chosen. They came marching out and they, they got carried back in coffins. You can't mess with God and win. Their progress, like I said, was only halted And the battle was only lost when they stopped checking in with the Lord as they had it a couple of times. That's when the enemy gets his upper hand. You quit checking in with God, you're going to lose. You stay plugged in with him. You know his will. All of the enemies are defeated. Fear goes. Doubt goes. Selfishness goes. Covetousness goes. Anger goes away. It just has to go away. I did a lot of fighting when I was a kid. You might not have guessed. But I got in a lot of fights. And I won more than I lost. And I think the reason was I didn't care if I killed you or not. Until I got saved. It's hard to fight when you don't want to hurt somebody. Like you just want to stop them. You get hurt. 
bad. Hearts change. God changes your heart. You can't fight with that kind of abandon anymore. Now, if someone tried to hurt you, I think I might still do that. Or my wife or my children. You know, then there's cause. But beyond that, you pull me, you know, you cut me off on the freeway. I'll be all right. I'll live through it. I can handle it. Usually. <laughs> I quoted a couple of those psalms at him from time to time. Lord, break their teeth in their mouth. Thank you. <laughs> But, but it, only, it only happened, the enemy only won when they got their eyes off the Lord. You and I have far more opportunity than that, don't we? So, so we stay close. Not, not a man of all of their enemies stood. The Lord delivered them from all of them. So every enemy falls before the Lord. Pretty good to know, isn't it? Amazing to think about. Isaiah would have the Lord declaring to the nation in chapter 41, Fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, there are those incensed against you. They shall be put to shame, and they're going to be disgraced. They'll be as nothing as those who strive. They'll perish. You'll seek them but not find you. And those who contend with you, those that war with you, they'll be like nothing. Because I am with you. I like these verses. And whenever we run into trouble in the world, I just go, I'm so glad to go, hey, you have to talk to my dad. And by the way, he never has lost a battle. And he's not about to lose this one. Faithful God had been to this nation to deliver every enemy into their hand. God wants you to be an overcomer. You know that, right? He doesn't want you a victim. He wants you to win. For his glory. For his sake, to have victory over yourself and over your circumstances and over the, the temptation that can easily grab you and, and seek to destroy. Look, the enemy is still going to camp in the land of promise. <laughs> in fact, you don't belong he, to be here. You're, you're just visiting this planet, aren't you? This isn't your home. You're just passing through. But, it, it, you know, God wants you to kind of be like a, a, a adhesive tape, you know? He wants you stuck to people. You can just drag them along with you. Come on. Over here. And I pray that the rest of 2017 might find you victorious over the enemies that are in your life that have been hampering you in many ways far too long. The Lord gave them the land. God gave them rest. God was faithful to deliver them from all of their enemies. Verse 45, And not a word has failed of any good thing which the Lord has broken uh, to the house of Israel. All has come to pass. Everything has come to pass. You wonder how much of God's word you can count on? Just underline the word all, all, all. God hasn't failed. He won't fail. He can't fail. You'll fail. I'll fail. We'll fail. He won't. When they broke the covenant, he upheld it. When they thought of going back to Egypt, he, st he slowed them down and assured them that they shouldn't go there, that that's no place for them. God's word stands because God stands for his word. Always. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. True then, true now. Isaiah said it. As the rain comes down from heaven, snow as well. It doesn't go back into the heavens. It waters the earth. It brings forth fruit, uh, bud and it, it, it seed for the sower and bread for the eater. That's how my word is. It goes out of my mouth. It, it shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish what I send it to do. It'll prosper in the thing that I send it to do. God's word is powerful, right? It, it, it changes things. It changes you. It changes me. I love Joshua's excitement as he hands off the ball to say, God's done it. Now we just have to live with it. We have a land, we have a place, we have a purpose, we've seen it fulfilled. How awesome to be able to live with the kind of confidence that says God will do as he said, you can count on it. Is that the way you live? When you face your day, do you begin by saying, well, at least God's in charge. I know his word. The one who promised to give his son to be born of a virgin, how laughable that is, but he did it. 
And not only a virgin, but one in Bethlehem. All right, that limits the, the, the odds. But he did it. He told us he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that that money would be thrown to the priest and build a, it would be used to buy a, a burial ground for the poor, and it was. Every detail of his birth and his ministry, his rejection, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, are known through the prophets so that when he shows up, we might go, well, you can certainly count on what he said. Today we live at a time when Ezekiel wrote in chapter 37 that after, well, that was 2,600 years ago, that in the last day God would bring Israel back into the land. And guess where they're at? Sitting in the land. Holy? Hardly. Hardly. If you go to Israel, you'll find out otherwise. They're not holy. But they're chosen. And they're the fulfillment of God's word. That he's going to one day gather them from every corner of the earth, from where he has scattered them. And they're going to dwell together as one nation in the land. That's happening. Over 55% of every Jew alive today lives in Israel. It's a remarkable story that just says God is faithful to his word. So today we live with the fulfillment of his word. And if that is all true, then soon and very soon we're going to see the king. The Lord will come. So God keeps his word. He did it in the past. He'll do it in the present. It'll assure you of a good future. His word cannot fail. Moses said it really clearly in, in Numbers 23. He said, God's not a man that he should lie. The son of man that he should repent. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Has he not spoken? Will he not make it good? It's worth going to Bible study. Because then you'll know what's true. And you can hang on to the promises of God. If he says he loves you, it's because he does. Now we all stand around and wonder why, but what he does. When he tells you that he will forgive you and not remember your sins, he will. And he won't. He will forgive you. He will forget your sin. The, the slate is clean. Don't think for five minutes you're going to go to the heaven and go, yeah, a couple of problems here that just came off the computer. No problems, man. The blood of his son has washed us from all sin. You have absolute access to, to God because of it. When he assures you that all things work together for good to those who love him, you can count on it. It does. Well, I don't get it. Well, nobody said you had to get it. That's not one of the promises. The promise is, is it, and Jack will understand. Never find that in there. When he tells you he's coming again to gather you to himself, that where he as you might be also, rest assured, he's coming again. He promised them the land. He gave it to them. He promised them rest all around. He gave it to them. He promised them that no enemy could stand in their presence, and he took out every enemy. Not one word of all of his promises failed. It's a good God to serve. I don't understand why you're not reading your Bible more. You really want to know what's in there. There's lots to go on, isn't there? Father, tonight as we sit together, how faithful you have been to us. We think about even our church that 32 years ago were four people sitting in a house in, in Whittier. And today, thousands of folks here and, and tens of thousands listening every day by the radio and missionaries in many places and just, just such a blessing, pastors going out. How thankful we are for the work of your spirit. How amazed we are, God, that you would do with us such glorious things. And, and I pray for us as a church that we would not settle in or, or just be self-serving in our in our church life, but that we would, Lord, come to church with great ambition and great hopefulness. I, I think about this old-timer Josh who was so excited about reviewing your work that you hadn't failed at all. That everything you said, though it, it looked for years like maybe it wouldn't happen, it did. And that your word can be counted on and that the enemy has to fall. And peace and rest come from hearts that know God. And that we need to gain ground in our spiritual lives so that the world isn't pushing us further away from you, but Lord, we're overcomers. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're, we're overcomers in this life. That sin has to take a turn and, and the enemy has to leave us be because we belong to you. 
May I encourage you tonight, just in those four things that we looked at, to, to write them down, carry them with you, remind yourself of them in the days to come. It's a good thing to be reminded. It's so easy to settle in, right? It's, we do this every week. We sit here and I sit in this corner and this is my spot. There's so much more available. We live in a world that just seems to have lost its mind. And yet we serve a God who left us here to be a light in a dark place. He loves the world. He loves the lost. He, he loves those who have gone astray. He sends his people out after them. Jesus told that parable of the shepherd who found the one sheep that had been lost out of his hundred and he had such joy. That's how God's heart is when someone gets saved. He, he's so thrilled that they've joined the pack, joined the herd, became a part of his body. May God's promises keep you above the fray and, and his goodness above any kind of depression or difficulty or discouragement that you might find. He's worth serving. He doesn't fail. He's good, and he is for you. And listen to this old timer in what is really his last, much, much his last declaration, certainly the summary of all that he sees before some final words of parting. This is the God that we serve. He doesn't fail, not at one place. And he won't fail you tonight. He will not fail you tonight. Just get to know him. Listen to what he says. Follow his direction. And you'll find the life that God has where every place that you put your foot will belong to you. It's only when sin promises to us you know, more satisfaction than God. We believe that we're going we're gonna to suffer. Sin's pleasurable, the Bible says, only for a season. but joy can come in the morning if we look to him. So may you do that. And if you need prayer tonight, our pastors will be up front. We'd love to pray with you that you might leave your cares and leave your burdens and, and, and lay your worries at his feet and, and your, your, your circumstances. God is able. Just say it to yourself. God is able to do all that he has declared. So glad to know that he is. Who would you rather serve than he? Let's stand together, shall we?